Good April. Um, although it's going to be pretty chilly later this week, so when I'm filming this on Monday, it was a pretty nice day. Um, so it may feel a little more like March. At any rate, uh, hopefully at this point, by the time you're watching this Ed Puzzle, you've already um, taken the quiz, the reading quiz, over energy from the physics classroom. So at that point, you probably should have an understanding of the mathematical formulas that we're going to be using, which are listed up here. Kinetic energy, and these are for mechanical energy, by the way, which are the things we're going to be focusing on in physics. Kinetic energy, one-half mass, velocity squared. And normally when I'm in class, I go through a pretty decent development of how we come up with these formulas. Um, but you've done the reading in physics classroom, and I'm not going to go through that at this point in time. So the idea behind that is that if you double something's velocity, you're going to quadruple its kinetic energy. Essentially, that means if you're going 70 miles per hour, you have almost doubled the energy as if you're going 50 miles per hour in a car. That's actually why it takes about double the length to stop a car going 70 miles per hour from 50 miles per hour. So that's a safety issue, right? Gravitational potential energy, PEG or PE grav, mass, G, which is the 10 newtons per kilogram, or 9.8 if you'd like, times H. Now this H is somewhat deceptive, and then it's from a reference height. And you choose that arbitrarily. If you recall, that's something that was stated in the physics classroom. We like to choose a spot that's easy for us, although as long as we're consistent throughout a problem, it doesn't particularly matter. Eh, this is getting a little better. Um, elastic potential energy, or energy in a spring. Some springs only stretch, some springs only squish or compress, some springs do both. So in this case, this is dependent on one half. K is something known as a spring constant, and it tells you how strong a spring is. So it's basically in newtons per meter. So if you have a strong spring with a high spring constant, it takes a lot of newtons per meter to stretch or compress the spring. And this delta x squared is displacement from equilibrium. So when a spring isn't stretched or compressed, there's no stored energy. If it is stretched or compressed from the equilibrium position, the amount of that stretch or compression in meters squared multiplied by the spring constant and times one half gives us the elastic or spring potential energy. Finally, work is a way that energy comes and goes out of a particular system. So work is force times this big D is displacement. I had to kind of erase that in the direction of motion. So if I have something like this and I'm lifting it up, I'm applying a force in the direction of motion. I'm doing work on this remote control. If, however, I'm doing something like this, I'm not increasing its gravitational potential energy. I'm not increasing its speed. I'm not doing work in that particular case. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, this formula and this formula actually are pretty similar because this mg is a gravitational force. That's a distance just vertically. So these are pretty similar to each other. Uh, so we'll come back to that. All these are measured in the standard units of joules. Um, a joule is um, a fairly small unit of energy. Calories that you burn, I think there's eh, like around 4 joules, 4.2 joules per calorie maybe, something like that. It's a small unit. Um, so these are things to remember, and hopefully you have them written down somewhere, so when we have a quiz or test, you can come back to those. We're going to be using something called LOL charts, as you can sort of see here, L-O-L. -L. I've got an extended version, O-L. Um, and these are things that end up um, also being known as work energy bar charts. And I'm going to ask you to do some things with these conceptually, and then I'm going to ask you to do some things with them uh, mathematically. So I'm going to go through a couple examples here. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, but pause the video if you need to, um, because I want to make sure that it doesn't take like 45 minutes to do this. The key situation here, when we're thinking about these situations with energy, things, are to think about things like, what's your system? What's your zero reference height? And is there friction? So I don't think I can move that somewhere else now. So I'm going to show you what we're going to be doing here for this particular energy interaction. I'm going to look at this. 
which is a little springy toy. It's cute. It's a little frog. It's got a spring as part of it. I'm going to put it on the tabletop, which is right here. And we're going to let it pop up. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Went out of the screen, though, but that's okay. So, obviously, I'm doing work on it, but now it's got some sort of energy and other sorts of energies that's bouncing up and coming back down. So I want to think about this particular system. And we're going to change this as time goes on to modify things. For right now, I want the system to be the frog toy. Toy frog, I guess. The spring that's attached to the frog, you might think of it as the same thing, but I'm going to call it something separate. The tabletop and the earth. The earth actually has to always be in our systems if we ever have gravitational potential energy because it's interacting with whatever object has got gravitational potential energy. The zero reference height I'm going to say is the tabletop. Is there friction? Well, in this sort of interaction where this thing starts down low, bounces up and comes up, there might be, but it's easier if we think there's not, and if we don't observe that there be, there's friction, let's choose that there's not, at least initially. So we're going to say no. So I'm going to have to move that off to the side to draw things, but we're going to end up going from there. All right, so let's take a look at three different situations. The first situation, the initial condition, is after I've squished the spring, so compressed on the table. <clears throat> Next, Let's look at this middle condition where it's just popping off the table, just barely off the table as it's popped up, and it's moving. Not pooped. That's pretty bad. Just popped off the table. The final condition we're going to look at here is you can think of it as anywhere going up to its maximum height or coming back down. I don't want it when it's come back down to the table, but in my classes today, they picked it at the very tippy top of the pad. Top of path. All right, so let's now talk about these energies. Each of these bar charts has four columns in it. Gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy, kinetic energy, and this E internal, which honestly probably shouldn't be in the first diagram, but that's okay. We only get that if we have heat due to friction. And that's because physicists and engineers think of heat as kind of a waste product and not something very interested. Um, chemists would probably react differently to that. This is an energy transfer circle, which lets us know whether energy is coming into or leaving a system. Over here in the middle condition, we've again got gravitational potential energy, spring or elastic potential energy, kinetic potential or kinetic energy, not potential, and then internal energy. And the same energy is over here, but for some reason I do this kind of sloping down. I don't know why. At any rate, if we go back over here, at the beginning condition where the spring is compressed, if our table is our reference site, I would say we have no gravitational potential energy. This is just sitting on the table. So I'm going to draw that blue line right there. What about spring energy? Well, the spring is compressed when it's on the table, so it's got to have some energy. And you might say, well, exactly how much? This is somewhat arbitrary. So I'm going to choose, say, I don't know, four bars. So this is qualitative, not quantitative. It's eh, semi-quantitative, I guess. So I'm counting bars, but I'm not looking at exact joules of energy. The kinetic energy, it's not moving on the table, so that's zero. And there's no friction in this case, so that's zero. What about over here, just after it popped off the table? Well, 
you could think of it still being just on the table, so we would have gravitational potential energy at zero. My classes today said they thought it was just a little bit higher, so we gave it a half a bar. Is there any spring potential energy? Well, as soon as this thing lifts off the table, the spring isn't compressed or stretched anymore, so that would be zero. We have no internal energy because there's no friction. Well, how much would I have here? It's moving pretty fast as it leaves the table, but exactly how fast, I don't know. What I do know is energy is conserved, and that's a big idea. So if I haven't had energy come into or out of the system, and I don't have evidence that that's happened, if I have four total bars here, I should have four total bars here. So I needed an extra three and a half bars. That would be kinetic energy. Moving over here to this final situation, at the tippy top of its path, well, if it's at the tippy top of its path, it's not moving, so I've got zero kinetic energy, so it's not moving up or down. The spring still isn't squished or, com or uh, stretched, so that's zero. We said there was no friction, that's zero. I don't think I've had energy come in or go out, so there's nothing there. So all the bars, all four bars, would be in gravitational potential energy. Something like that. Okay. Well, now let's think about something a little bit different. Let's think about the same scenario, except now let's have the zero reference height not be the tabletop. Let's have it be the floor. So I'm going to scratch that out and put floor in green. So the floor is below the tabletop. So what that means is, although this probably still has the same amount of spring energy it has before, it has more gravitational potential energy because this MGH is no longer zero. There's a height that's greater than zero when you compare the tabletop to the floor. So in this particular case, I don't know exactly how many bars I'm going to give it. It probably should be way more than this, but I'm going to give it one bar just to make things simple. This, I would say, still has the same number of four bars. Still not moving, still no friction. What about right here? Well, in this particular case, if it's just left the table, it's moved up a little bit, so I've got to have more than one bar, because that's what I said I started with on the tabletop. Here I added half a bar compared to before, so this time I think I would have one and a half bars. Still have a lot of kinetic energy because it's moving really fast as it leaves the tabletop. So I think that would still be three and a half bars. This would still be zero. This would still be zero. No energy transfer here. And again, no energy transfer here. So last time I had four bars all the way through. Here I've got one plus four, that's five bars. One and a half plus three and a half, that's also five bars. So as you can imagine, over here, I'm going to have five bars as well. No spring energy, no kinetic energy, no internal energy at the top of its path. So the five bars, that extra gravitational potential is here. All right. Final example with this, or final scenario with this. Let's say now we have things where... We're still talking about the floor, but in this case, my system is not just the toy frog, it's just the toy frog, the tabletop, and the earth. The spring is not in our system. So I'm Xing that out, and that's, oops, sorry. I am Xing that out, and that's going to be in red. Okay, so my diagrams here are going to be in red. Well, initially, if the Floor is still my reference point. I still have one unit of gravitational potential energy. I'm going to show that in red now. 
but I don't have energy in the spring because the spring's not in my system. So that's going to be a zero. Okay, down here, no kinetic energy, that's back at zero. No internal energy, that's at zero. So I've only got one bar of energy. What about over here? Well, where it just popped off the table, it's moving pretty fast, so it still has kinetic energy. In fact, I would say it has the same amount as it had before, three and a half bars of kinetic energy. And it's still the same height above the ground as it was before. So I'm going to say it has one and a half bars of gravitational potential energy compared to the floor. So in the previous two parts of this example, we've had the number of bars over here equal the number of bars over here. But now I've got one bar and five bars. Why? Because my system included the spring earlier, but here it does not include the spring. So how do I take that into account? Well, I'm going to show that energy is transferring from outside the system into the system. So this is supposed to be a circle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw four bars coming inside. So I'm going to draw an arrow in. I'm going to say that's from the spring. So instead of before with energy conservation, where we had something like 5 equals 5 equals 5, now I've got 1 plus 4 coming in equals 5. And in this particular case, I don't have anything change between the second situation and the third. There's no energy entering or leaving the system because there's nothing to deal with the spring. We've got all five bars of gravitational potential energy, nothing for kinetic, nothing for spring energy, nothing for internal. So 1 plus 4 equals 5 equals 5. So our energy conservation is still good. So that's the first example. I'm going to do one other example in just a moment, and I'll string these videos together. Hello. Welcome to the second part of this. So I've got a toy here, I think it's from Toy Story, and I think its name is Slinky. And I can wind it up. I put the sling on, by the way, because my arm is starting to hurt me. So what we can do, we're thinking about this example now, where it's going to walk across the table. The initial condition is right now, just as it starts walking, after I wound it. The middle condition is going to be right here in the middle, where it's still walking. And the final condition, hopefully it doesn't go over the edge, literally. The final condition is going to be where it stops on the table. Like that. So we need to choose some things about our system as we go on here. So the question is, what's in my system? Well, how about the Earth? Does it always have to have the Earth? The toy plus the spring is inside the toy and the tabletop. What's my zero reference height? Let's make this simple again and go back with the table. I think it's actually two words. Is there friction? Well, that's a good question. My classes earlier today said they thought there was friction. If you're uncertain and you guess wrong, you could always change that. So they said they thought there was, and it kind of makes sense because it stops along the table. So we're going to say yes, maybe have a question mark. So we're going to use those um, suppositions for what we're doing here. So the scenario is... The initial condition, just starting to move, so just starting, but it's moving. Mm, moving, but 
but halfway done. And then resting on table, not moving. Got it. Okay. So in this particular case, yeah, this board is dirty. What do we have at the beginning? Well, the beginning here, and actually throughout this whole experience, we're going to have zero gravitational potential energy because this thing is staying on the table. So that kind of makes my life easy for that as I've out tripped on these whiteboards. I should say G, by the way. Is there spring energy here at the beginning? Makes sense. The spring is inside the toy here. You can sort of see where the wind-up mechanism is. And I wound it up beforehand. Again, if I was asking you about the initial situation before, I would have done work on this spring, but we're not. We're saying that's our initial condition. So I'd say, yeah. So let's pick a number of bars. It doesn't matter exactly how many. So I'm going to say, I don't know, three bars. Is there kinetic energy? Okay. Initially, there is kinetic energy because I said it's actually already moving. How much? I don't know. Let's say one bar. Is there internal energy yet? Well, I don't think so. This thing just got started, so it really hasn't had a chance to heat up at this point. So we're going to say no. What about here a little later on? Okay. A little later on, there's still some spring energy. If it's halfway done, my earlier classes said to make this one and a half bars, which kind of makes sense to me. Is it moving? It is. It actually stays pretty much the same speed until right before the end, so I'm still going to give this one bar. Four bars over here, two and a half bars over here, so the question is what happens? Well, the energy's got to go somewhere. And this is where, well, we can't normally figure things out any other way where we could say, ah, there's got to be some friction involved. So the question is, where does it go? In other words, does it leave the system? And if it does, I would draw an arrow like this, saying to environment. And I'd have to show, like, if I'm missing four bars to two and a half, that would be one and a half bars. Are you missing? But I'm not sure about that, because our system is the tabletop, the dog, the slinky, things like that. So if we we're not thinking that it goes to the environment, the other way we could say this, and probably a little more likely in this particular case, is instead of having it leave the system, what we could say is it's actually going into this internal energy as heat. You are going to feel that on that tiny little toy, but hopefully you realize that if your car's running for five minutes or so, it gets hot. So I'm going to have one and a half bars here. One and a half plus one and a half is three, plus one is four, so we're pretty good. At the end here, the spring has wound out, so there's no, we can think of it as having no elastic potential energy. It's not moving anymore. Again, assuming that this is going to stay in the system, and you could choose either way, we need to account for it. And in this case, I'd have all four bars over here as internal energy. I'm not worried that this seems to be dissipating or going in there at a little bit uneven rate. The point is, is I've accounted for all of it at some point. So that's that particular way of thinking about things. Um, so really deciding whether there is friction or not matters, deciding what your system is matters. The last example I'm going to do, and I'm probably going to do this on a different night because it's 10 o'clock at night now and my arm hurts. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one example with or quantitative values as well as bar charts so you know how to handle the numbers. Thanks, and we'll do that later. Hello, this is the last part of the Ed Puzzle. I know it's a long one, but again, I think this really helped my students in class when we talked about these types of things. Notice the arm's moving a little more. Hopefully I don't whack it against something. At any rate, this is going to be 
on the work energy bar charts, example two, which is toward the back. Example one of the bungee jumper I did in class with my own students. We might do that Thursday at the Google Meet, um, so I might try to go over that. At any rate, this is going to be more quantitative. So if you think about things quantitatively with energy, we come back to these formulas, which ah, I had posted earlier. I'm smudging things. Kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Gravitational potential energy, mgh. Elastic potential or spring potential energy, one half k delta x squared. Work, force times distance. All measured in units of joules, 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 joules. It's a universal unit of energy in the international system. So we're going to kind of take that down because it's blocking things here. Here's the example. We've got a 200, pardon me, a 2,000 kilogram elevator at a 40 meter elevation above the ground. This is the zero height. And it's moving at 4 meters per second downward. And it goes down to the ground and is brought to a stop by a braking system. So this initial condition is moving down at 4 meters per second, and here it is stopped. You want to find the amount of energy transferred to the braking system. This is a very different level than that one. I don't know why I did that. Anyhow, um, maybe I'll switch that. Maybe I will switch that. EK for kinetic energy, EG for gravitational potential energy, EE for elastic or spring potential energy. And this is initial conditions. Okay, so we want to solve it both conceptually with the um, lull charts or the work energy bar charts, but also mathematically. This is the system boundary. So notice the braking system is up here. That's not in our system. The elevator moving is in our system, the earth is in our system. So at least initially, and these are not necessarily going to represent the final numbers, but initially we're moving, so I've got some kinetic energy. So I'm going to draw that as, say, one bar. It doesn't seem like it's moving very fast, but I don't know exactly how much it is. Is it elevated? It is elevated quite a bit. This is actually at 40 meters. So I'm going to say it's got three bars of gravitational potential energy. There's no spring, nothing stretched or compressed, so that would be zero. What about at the end? Well, at the end, it's on the ground, it's not moving. It's not elevated. There is no spring or elastic potential energy. Well, there is friction, because there's a braking system, but the question is, is, is that there? The braking system is here outside my system, so I don't think that heat is in my system. So I'm going to have zero, zero, zero for all these. So the question is then what happens? Well, the energy is transferred, so I'm going to out of the system. So I'm going to draw an arrow out. I'm going to have four bars going out, to the braking system. Now. I didn't mention the system here because I've mentioned it over here, but the system itself is actually going to be the elevator and the earth. Also, the zero height position was listed over here, and we know there's friction because there is a braking system. So there is, yes, the friction. So now we want to handle things mathematically. Okay, how do we do that? If we had the same amount of energy here and here, I would start off by saying E initial equals E final. And then I could go through some calculations with this. Here, however, my final energy is zero, so I can't say E initial equals E final. I could say E initial minus the energy of the braking system equals zero. And exactly how much would that be is something we could figure out. So I'm going to write it down like that. E initial minus the energy to the braking system 
equals zero because my final energy is zero. So if I add this to both sides, in other words, I put plus breaking system on this side and plus breaking system on this side, that tells me that my initial energy is equal to the energy of the breaking system. So when I do that, now I've got to think about what types of energy I have. Well, I've got kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. So I'm going to see EK plus EG equals this braking system. Now technically, I could think about this as work, force times distance on the right side, but I'm not going to do that. Because that's not what's being asked. KE, one half. M, V squared, gravitational, M, G, H. And that's the same thing. Well, what are the numbers that I've got? Well, the numbers that I have are 1 half, the mass is 2,000, velocity is 4 meters per second, that's squared, plus 2,000, I'm going to say g is 10 instead of 9.8, so 10 newtons per kilogram, times the height, which was 40 meters. All that equals the energy of the braking system, which is what we're trying to find out. The handwriting is horrible. Okay, so now let's put some... I'm going to do this math in my head. 4 squared is 16. 16 times 2 is 32. This is 32,000 times a half. So that is 16,000 joules of kinetic energy. 2,000 times 10 is 20,000. 20,000 times 4 is 80,000. So I think this is 800,000 joules. Of potential energy. It seems like that ratio is a bit off to me, so I'm going to just check it in my head. So it's going to be 2,000 times 10 times 40, and yeah, that is actually 800,000. So, yeah, my bar charts weren't right. I was right that this was more than this, but it's a lot more than I thought. So overall, This will be 816,000 joules is transferred to the braking system. So that's how I did that problem mathematically up here in green is how we did it conceptually with the bar charts. So hopefully that's a good example for you for part two of the work energy bar charts. Magic word, goose.